Welcome to the FAA's virtual public workshop on the draft environmental assessment for the South Central Florida Metroplex. I'm Michael O'Hara, Regional Administrator for the FAA Southern Region. Florida is the only state in the country with four major international airports, Miami, Fort Lauderdale Hollywood, Orlando, and Tampa. Palm Beach and St. Pete Clearwater International are also important airports in the national airspace system. In addition, Florida has a significant number of general aviation airports. You get the picture. Florida is one of the busiest states for aviation in the United States. The South Central Florida Metroplex is the FAA's plan to modernize air traffic procedures for 21 airports in the southern half of Florida. Many of the existing procedures are based on outdated technology. While safe, these procedures are less precise and efficient than those based on satellite technology. The satellite-based routes proposed for the Metroplex project will enhance safety and efficiency across the region. Metroplex will benefit passengers by creating more direct routes, decrease congestion at airports and in the air, improve air traffic flows, enhancing safety and efficiency, and reduce complexity and communication for air traffic controllers and pilots, making the system safer. Before we can change procedures, the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, requires us to conduct an environmental assessment to determine the potential impacts of the proposed procedures. One purpose of NEPA is to ensure that proposals, alternatives, and environmental impacts of projects are fully disclosed to the public. That's why we're here today. On May 11th, the FAA posted the Draft Environmental Assessment, or EA, for the Metroplex, and we opened a 60-day public comment period that closes on July 10th. We hope that you will consider submitting comments about the document. On this website, you can click the Comments tab, and it will show you how to submit your comments. It provides email addresses and a physical address where you can send comments after the workshop. Be sure to get your comments in before the July 10th deadline. After the comment period closes, we will review and consider all substantive comments received during the comment period as we develop the environmental determination. We expect to issue the determination by September 30th, 2020. A note about the draft EA. The FAA identified inadvertent errors related to runway designations for Orlando, Tampa, and St. Pete Clearwater International Airports. We updated the document on May 13th, and it's posted at metroplexenvironmental.com. I'd like to cover three procedural items before we start. First, if you're having technical issues, you can text us anytime during the workshop at 949-478-0253 or click the technical support tab on this webpage. Second, the workshop will last 90 minutes. We are recording the workshop and it will be posted on this website tomorrow for you to review. You can share the link with friends and neighbors who are unable to participate today. And finally, we have experts available to answer questions about the draft EA and the proposed air traffic control procedures. FAA air traffic controllers, environmental specialists, and industry representatives will answer your questions after the presentation. As a reminder, the questions asked and answers provided here are not part of the official record for the draft EA. To comment for the official record, click on the comments tab on this website. That will link you to the FAA's official comment page for this project. Now, Lisa Favors, an environmental specialist for the FAA's air traffic organization, will brief us on the draft environmental assessment. Thank you, Michael. 
I will explain the draft EA for the, the South Central Florida Metroplex. As mentioned earlier, we developed the document in accordance with NEPA, which requires us first to identify the purpose and need for the project. In this case, the purpose and need addresses the current inefficient arrival and departure procedures for airports in South Central Florida. Many of the existing procedures are based on outdated technology and are less precise and efficient than satellite procedures. We need to fix that. The draft EA identifies causes for inefficiency as lack of predictable routes or procedures to transition aircraft between airport runways and high altitude in route airspace complex interactions between converging routes and lack of flexibility for air traffic controllers as they transition flights between high altitude and low altitude airspace. By adopting new procedures, which the draft EA calls the proposed action, we expect reduced workload due to fewer controller pilot communications more efficient operations due to decreased complexity and fewer flight segments resulting in more predictable traffic flows. A detailed explanation of the purpose and need is included in chapter two of the draft EA. The draft EA analyzes potential environmental impacts from the proposed action and the no action alternative. It is important to note that we analyze many additional procedures, but they not carried forward for detailed study in the draft EA because they did not meet the purpose and need or applicable safety standards. Under no action, procedures in place from June 2017 to May 2018 would remain except for planned modifications that are independent of the Metroplex. Our analysis determined that only the proposed action would meet the purpose and need for the project. The no action alternative would not meet the purpose and need, but it was included in the draft EA as required by Council on Environmental Quality Regulations. The alternatives are described in chapter three of the draft EA. Affected environment describes the human physical, and natural environmental conditions that the proposed action could affect. The affected environment is described in detail in Chapter 4 of the Draft EA. The Draft EA considers the effects on 14 environmental resource categories and their subcategories identified in FAA guidance. We evaluated the alternatives under conditions forecasted for 2021, the first year the proposed action could be implemented, and under the 2026 forecasted condition. The evaluation considers the direct, indirect, and cumulative effects of the proposed action and no action alternatives. The draft EA determined that neither the proposed action nor the no action alternatives are likely to cause significant environmental impacts to any of the environmental resource categories. For more information, you can review chapter five in the draft EA. The rest of my discussion will focus on the noise analysis since you, the public, express most interest in that. However, feel free to ask questions about any category during the Q&A session later in the workshop. First, I will explain how we measure noise. The FAA measures aviation noise using the day-night average sound level, DNL, metric. DNL represents noise as it occurs over a 24-hour period, with nighttime noise weighted more heavily than daytime noise. DNL is the standard noise metric used for studies of aviation noise exposure in communities. 
To account for differences in how people respond to noise, we use the A-weighted scale, DBA. This scale closely approximates the volume of sound as perceived by the human ear. The FAA considers aircraft noise exposure of 65 DNL in residential areas and noise increases of DNL 1.5 dB or more for noise sensitive areas exposed to noise at or above the DNL 65 dB noise exposure level to be significant. The noise analysis demonstrates that the proposed action would not result in significant noise increases. More information about how the FAA measures noise is in Appendix E of the draft EA, and a detailed noise analysis can be found in Appendix I. Before I end, the following video will show you how to look up noise information for your address. You may search more than 122,000 grid points of noise data in the study area, presented in decibels, abbreviated as DB. The grid points are U.S. Census population points located at one half nautical mile intervals across the entire study area. The map opens to the study area. In the search bar, start typing your address and similar addresses will pop up. Click on the correct address and you will see a light blue map pin. The map shows the model grid points in blue. Click on each point to see a pop-up with noise analysis results. The map shows data including DNL calculated for the alternatives and the change in noise when the proposed action is compared to the no action alternative. Now our air traffic control expert will brief you on some of the more significant procedures the Metroplex proposes for your area. Hello, my name is Jeff and I'm an air traffic controller at Tampa International. We will walk you through a few of the flight procedure poster boards for Tampa International and St. Pete Clearwater International Airport. Each of the following boards shows a sampling of existing flight tracks and proposed new flight procedures for jet traffic. Each board will show either arrival or departure aircraft with current day tracks color coded via altitude. The flight tracks and proposed procedures are all overlaid on a map of the surrounding area. Each flight procedure board is oriented with north facing up. The name of the airport and the names of the flight procedures are in the box in the upper right hand corner. This box also shows the type of operation, either arrival or departure, and the direction of flight, which we will call flow, either north, south, east, or west. Flow is related to the layout of the airport's runways. For example, north flow runways include runway one left and one right. These runways allow aircraft to land and depart northbound. Runways one nine or left and runway one nine or right are used in a south flow operation and allows aircraft to land and depart southbound over Tampa Bay. A few acronyms are used in the boards. A standard instrument departure or SID is a departure. A standard terminal arrival or STAR is an arrival. Area navigation or RNAV is the term for modern satellite based navigation technology used in the proposed procedures. The spelling of each arrival or departure procedure is limited to five letters. For example, the spelling of BLFRG is pronounced bullfrog. The stars on the board are locations of waypoints, which are fixed navigation points in space that the aircraft fly to. Just as with the spelling of procedures, waypoints are spelled with five letters. For example, the JSTRM waypoint would be pronounced JetStream. The proposed flight procedures are colored purple for departures and orange for arrivals. These colored paths show the intended flight paths in the future for most flights using the new procedures. Surrounding the paths are dispersed path areas in either pink, 
for departures or yellow for arrivals. These areas show the possible locations where aircraft may fly in the future and account for the possibility of different routing to avoid hazardous weather for operational need or for safety. The existing flight tracks are shown on the legend by color, starting from lowest altitudes in pink, then blue, then teal, and finally the highest altitudes are in green. Here are examples of arrival flight tracks landing at Tampa International Airport to the north. Notice the colors changing and their respective altitudes associated with the colors. The flight tracks shown are a sample of jet aircraft operations which occurred in March of 2018 for Tampa and January to May of 2018 for St. Pete during daytime, which does not include nighttime hours between 11 p.m. and 6 a.m. The bullet points on the right provide additional details about the procedures. My name is Chuck and I'm an air traffic controller at the Tampa International Airport. Next, we'll look at each arrival and departure board for these airports. This flight procedure board is for the Tampa International Airport north flow arrivals, which means airplanes are arriving over Tampa Bay and taken off to the north over land. There are four proposed arrival procedures, the Bullfrog, Dates, Matey, and Rays. Where only one left is used for the majority of operations for north flow, although runway one right is also used. North flow is the more common direction of traffic flow. Aircraft arriving from the west use a raise and mate arrival procedures. Aircraft from the north and the east use a dades arrival, and aircraft from the south use a bullfrog arrival procedure. Aircraft arriving to the Tampa area will fly to a navigational waypoint. After that, an air traffic controller will issue a pilot a heading called a vector and that will guide them to the airport to land. For example, on the day's arrival procedure, aircraft will fly to either Guzda, Ports, Jetstream Waypoint, and are given headings to the airport. For all procedures, air traffic controllers may direct aircraft away from the procedure to avoid hazardous weather, for operational need, or for safety. The next board is for south flow arrivals, which means airplanes are arriving overland and taking off to the south over Tampa Bay. There are four proposed arrival procedures, Bullfrog, Dades, Matey, and Rays. As you can see, the proposed procedure mimic current day flight track airplanes fly today. South flow is a less common direction of flow. Runway 19 left, runway 19 right are used equally for south flow operation. Aircraft arriving from the west use the Rays and Matey arrival procedures. Aircraft to the north, and east use the Dade's arrival procedures, and aircraft from the south use the Bulldog arrival procedure. As with north flow arrivals, aircraft from the south flow arriving to the Tampa area will fly to a navigational waypoint on each procedure. After that, an air traffic controller will give a pilot a heading to follow called a vector that will guide them to the land at the airport. The next board is for north flow departures, which aircraft take off to the north over land. There are five proposed departure procedures, the Gandhi, Bapo, Nost, Ended, and Crowd. Generally, aircraft with northern destinations would use the Bapo departure. Aircraft with destinations to the northwest would use the Ended departure. Southerly destinations use the Gandhi departure. Southeast departures use the Crowd, and the westbound departures use the Nost departure. Aircraft depart and after departure, an air traffic controller will give a pilot a heading called a vector that will guide them out of the Tampa area to join one of the departure procedures. For example, aircraft on the Bapa departure will be given a navigational heading to Finky Waypoint. Aircraft will fly a similar path as they do today to get to these procedures. The next board is for south flow departures, which is aircraft departing to the south over Tampa Bay using one of the five proposed departure procedures. The Bapo, Sykes, Ended, Gandhi, and Crowd. Generally, aircraft with northern destinations will use the Bapo and Ended departures. Aircraft with destinations to the southwest use the Sykes departure. East and southeast destinations use the Gandhi and Crowd departures. When an aircraft departs, an air traffic controller will give a pilot a heading to follow 
to join one of the five departure procedures based on their destination. This next board shows all proposed Tampa International Airport North Flow procedures, including the five departure procedures and five arrival procedures. As we've shown, North Flow is the most common direction of traffic flow at Tampa. For North Flow procedures, departures shown in purple are given a navigational heading to follow to join the departure procedures. Aircraft arriving to the Tampa area on routes shown in orange will fly in the proposed procedure until an air traffic controller issues a heading to guide the pilot to land. This next board is for operations at the St. Pete Clearwater International Airport and in a North Flow, which like Tampa is the most common direction of traffic. There are three proposed departure procedures, the BAPO, ENDED, and Sykes. As you can see, the proposed procedures mimic current day flight tracks airplanes fly today. Generally, aircraft with northern destinations will use the BAPO departure, Aircraft with destinations to the northwest use the ended departure, and southerly destinations use the Sykes departure. In a north flow, aircraft used runway 36 for the majority of operations and occasionally used runway 4. All right, good afternoon. Welcome to the workshop QA session for the uh, second meeting that we're having for Tampa and St. Pete Clearwater. Again, I'm Michael O'Hara. I'm the Regional Administrator for the FAA Southern Region, and I'm joined by technical experts for the session today, including Jeff, Chuck, and Chris, who are air traffic controllers from the Tampa International Airport Control Tower and Radar Approach Control, as well as Lisa Favors, FAA Environmental Specialist, and several others from the FAA, airport and airline industry representatives. And we have uh, Annabelle with us to help uh, with any needed Spanish translation as well. As a reminder, you may have heard in the intro, we're holding this workshop to answer your questions about the Metroplex project in South Central Florida. We're unable to answer questions during this workshop about other topics. You can submit your questions to us and you can do that through the, the chat box in Zoom or Facebook or YouTube, or you can text a question to us at 949-478-0253. Again, that number for texting questions again is 949-478-0253. If you need technical assistance during the workshop, please click on the technical support tab on our website. I wanna thank you again for joining us. So we're gonna jump right into the first question that we already have ready. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna read that one for you now. I live just north of Palm Harbor outside Tampa. It looks like I'm getting a lot of flights over my house. Is this new with the Metroplex? Chuck, do you want to help with that one? Yes, yeah, sir. Sure. I will. Thank you, Michael. Uh, today, the, uh, the aircraft that you're seeing over uh, Palm Harbor is no change in uh, anything that we've done in the past. These procedures will not go into place. Uh, earliest, uh, April 2021, and uh, likely the uh, ones that would affect uh, the Palm Harbor area will be in August of 2021. Uh, the only uh, changes that you'll see in the future will be the NOS departure. Aircraft that are departing Tampa going west out over the Gulf, instead of going down to the southwest like you see in the green area, south of St. Pete, they're gonna go due westbound. And uh, we did a flight simulation on this and worst case scenario, is the aircraft will pass over the coast about 9,000 feet, maybe higher, and that's the worst case scenario. So uh, the Palm Harbor area will see, likely see no changes in um, an aircraft or hear any changes in aircraft noise. We can't turn aircraft westbound until we leave 3,000 feet anyway. So uh, there are no changes currently, and the only proposed changes to those will be that nose departure in the future. Okay, thanks Chuck. I'm looking, it looks like we have another question that may tie in with that. This second question, will the new procedures increase the noise generated from aircraft? And I'm, I'm going to ask Lisa to help with that one. Sure, Michael. I'm sorry, I couldn't unmute myself. <laughs> I'll be happy to help with that. Um, the FAA Environmental analysis for the project measured more than 210,000 US 
census data block from year 2010. And within those areas, it measured noise at more than 100 and, uh, 117,000 points. Um, it showed that the proposed procedures would not result in any significant or reportable noise increases under the FAA criteria. Thanks. All right, thank you, Lisa. All right, we have a, a question here. I see flights going over the Starkey Wilderness Park. Are there more flights over that area? And did we study the environmental impacts? So for this one, I may ask air traffic control about that. I think it's north of Tampa. And then Lisa, you, you may want to chime in on that as well. Hey, Michael, this is Jeff. I'll take that question, uh, air traffic wise. Uh, the proposed procedures do not affect that area. Whatever aircraft are there today will be there tomorrow as far as uh, the flight paths. Uh, as far as an increase in traffic, we don't control that um, other than uh, just where we put the airplanes. So the procedures won't affect it. Okay, thanks, Jeff. And Lisa, anything to add on from in terms of the study of environmental impacts? I know you talked about the environmental assessments and data points, so the, the 117,000. So certainly in that area, we wouldn't have any significant noise analysis, uh, any noise impacts. And then it mentions that it's a wilderness park. So we also give attention in the environmental analysis to park areas or you know areas like that. And so those are analyzed from both perspectives. And I can tell you, it looks like Lisa's muted, but uh, I can tell you that there are no significant impacts in any of those environmental categories that were studied by the FAA. That is correct, Michael. I'm sorry, I'm having some technology, technological difficulties here. Um, that is, your, sum, your summation is right on point. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Lisa. Okay, we have a question. How many more meetings are going to be held are they all virtual? Um, I'll, I'll take a shot at that. I believe this is our third workshop and we're holding a total of 12 virtual public workshops during these first two weeks of June. They're covering four major international airports in Florida. So not only Tampa, but also Orlando, Fort Lauderdale and Miami and 17 additional airports. So these workshops provide residents with the opportunity to participate in an online briefing on the project, see some of our videos, look at some of the, the tools and analysis and those results, and then to ask questions of our experts, including air traffic control and environmental experts who have worked on the project. So I, nine more after today, and those are going to be virtual in the same format as this. Sessions like this are being recorded, so they can be watched after each day. They'll be posted the following day after each of the workshops. And our, our comment period for the projects open until July 12th. All right, let me continue. There's a question we received yesterday. How does the Metroplex impact MacDill Air Force Base? Uh, and do does the FAA handle their air traffic too? So Chris, I may ask for you to address that one. Thank you, Michael. Um, traffic in and out of MacDill is not changed by this procedure. Um, Tampa Approach Control works all those aircraft, but it'll be pretty much the same as today. Um, what you see, it'll be the same after this project. Okay, Chris, thanks. Okay, we have a question here. Will noise increase? And if it does, what will the FAA do about it? Lisa? Am I unmuted? Okay, great. <laughs> the procedures do not exceed the threshold um, of significant in any impact category. So, um, so there's no, there's no uh, mitigation being proposed for this project. Okay. All right, thanks, Lisa. We have a question. Um, 
where else have you implemented projects like this and what benefits and issues did they experience? That's actually a question that we were asked earlier in the week. Jim, do you want to help with that? Uh, Michael, yes, I can. Um, the South Central Florida project will be the 11th Metroplex and it will be the final Metroplex. It's uh, you know, one of the larger and, and more complex ones. We see a variety of different benefits and we have different objectives in each one. Uh, normally the um, efficiency of the uh, procedures and um, deconflicting the uh, traffic flows between the different airports, for instance, in, in, the Las Vegas, in the Los Angeles basin, there are a number of very closely uh, linked airports and the project there was intended to you know, deconflict those traffic flows and improve the efficiency of the arrivals into the, uh, the airports. Other places we've seen some pretty significant benefits in uh, fuel and emissions reduction, fuel burn and emissions reduction. And I, I always like to point out the uh, Cleveland and Detroit project, which is one of our more recent ones where we were able to uh, implement some procedural changes in Detroit that made a significant improvement in the arrival flow into Detroit. In fact, we think it, uh, at some periods of time, uh, we've seen a 30 to 40% reduction in uh, delays at the airport. So it, it, it depends upon the location, the weather, the uh, adjacent airports, but um, generally speaking, we've seen some pr pretty good benefits overall. Great, thanks, Jim. Okay, we have another question. This one uh, probably goes to air traffic. Uh, does the Metroplex make the planes fly higher over most communities in the Tampa area? Jeff, can you help with that? Sure, Michael. Uh, the answer to that is a no, the project does not cause the aircraft to fly higher over the area. Uh, they will be flying just the way they do today uh, as far as the altitudes go. So no, they won't be any higher uh, as far as Tampa goes or St. Pete. Okay. So I'm going to emphasize the part you said about flying just the way they do today, because if we say not higher, we don't really mean lower either, right, Jeff? Okay. I see you nodding. So, all right. Very good. So here's another question. I live to the north of the St. Pete Clearwater International Airport, and our traffic includes many different kinds of aircraft. Will these procedures be used for both commercial aircraft, uh, general aviation, corporate, and military aircraft? I'm gonna look to our air traffic control team for that. I'll take that one. Uh, thanks, Michael. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the procedures are for jet traffic only, uh, general aviation aircraft, that are not jet traffic do not apply to the Metroplex. It's only for uh, jet traffic. Uh, military aircraft, if, if they're departing from the uh, St. Pete or the Tampa airport, would fly those procedures just like they would um, if they were commercial jets. So it's jet traffic only, uh, no props, no turbo props. Okay, thank you, Chuck. And I know we have some industry, airline industry with us, pilots with us. So I'm not saying on that question particularly, but if you wanna jump in on any of these, we appreciate you being with us. We're seeing a lot of folks on Zoom and social media. So I wanna encourage everybody who's, who's listening in to uh, keep, keep your questions coming. That's what we're here for today. You can text us a question at 949-478 0253 949-478-0253 or you can use the zoom q a button if you're connected that way i'm going to keep moving through what we have here uh, actually this is a question we received yesterday in the workshop that we had last night the tampa airport has noise abatement procedures are you going to change those and how many changes will we see from Metroplex project here in Tampa. Hey, Michael, I'll go ahead and take that one. This is Jeff. Um, there will be no changes to any noise abatement that we do. Um, we have the noise abatement for, you know, the runway one right and uh, the departures off of St. Pete. Uh, those will not change. Uh, as far as the uh, amount of 
changes for Metroplex. Uh, they changed in name mostly only. Uh, the only procedure that will be new will be the uh, NOS departure, which we discussed earlier, that departs out to the west. All right, Jeff, thank you. Okay, moving to the next question. How did the draft environmental assessment determine aircraft noise? And can you show us that noise tool again? Um, I live near Bush Gardens. Uh, anyway, so I live near Bush Gardens. All right, so Lisa, I'm gonna <laughs> ask you to help with that. Okay, I'll be happy to help with that. Um, the draft EA modeled aircraft noise exposure for the proposed new procedures and the no action alternative under 2021 and 2026 20, forecasted conditions um, and considered the direct, indirect, and cumulative effects of noise. The FAA environmental um, aircraft noise used an annual day night average sound level that's called a DNL metric. Um, the significant noise is defined as day night average sound level of 65 decibels or higher. The DNL metric is a single value representing um, aircraft sound over a 24 hour period and it includes all aircraft sound generated within that period. Um, let's see, a DNL, the DNL metric also includes a 10 decibel weighting for noise events between 10 p.m. and 7 a.m. And that weighting helps to account for a greater level of annoyance um, from noise events at nighttime. So, so the metric essentially equates one nighttime flight to 10 daytime flights. Now, I know you are concerned about the area you're li living in, Bush Garden area, but I can show you this, um, uh, the noise map tool, the noise tool that was developed for this project. Um, you can search, again, I talked about earlier that we, um, we searched more than 122,000 grid points of noise data in, across the entire study area. And, it, when you come to this noise tool, when you when you came to the workshop, you had to go to floridametroplexworkshops.com. And on that uh, main page, you will see a button across the top. Um, it's circled right there. It's called the noise tool button. Once you click that, it brings you to this page. And there's a short description um, that talks about the DNL, what DNL um, noise results are included in this noise map. Um, it also gives you our significance threshold, the FAA significance threshold and the threshold for reportability of noise. Now, if you want to look at the results at your particular address, you can type in the search bar at the top left-hand corner of that map and start typing an address. And once you do that, similar addresses will pop up and you can click on your particular address, be it your home, your, re your residence, your church, your, your school. And um, once you click there, it'll bring you to a light blue map pen right there in the middle of the screen. Um, around that address, you'll see blue circles, little blue dots. And then those, those are the, um, the, the, uh, the, the noise data that were collected at these half in, um, one half integral, in, interval miles across the entire study area and find the one closest to your residence and you can see information that we collected about um, the noise in your area. Thank you, Michael. All right, thank you, Lisa. So that's model data and lots of data points around. That's a tool that'll be available after the workshop if people wanna go in, as Lisa said, and check areas of interest to you. So very good, thanks. All right, I'm going to, it uh, looks like we have one here that maybe has two parts. Uh, first part, are your departure procedures RNAV off the ground or are they vector? And uh, the second part is, are your noise baselines based on existing radar tracks or previous part 150 studies? I think I'm gonna ask air traffic to help with that first part. And then Lisa, I'll come back to you on the, the noise 
piece of that. Hey, Michael, I'll take that one. So our departures off of Tampa are still what are called a vector SID. So they will initially come off on a heading or depart the airport on a heading. And then we vector to join the procedure, which all our procedures really start at 10,000 feet and above. So I can take that part of it. Like I said, it is a vector SID. I do not know on the noise okay. portion. We'll defer to no, Lee. I'll good. take that's the good. noise Chris. portion. <laughs> Thank you. The noise. The uh, simple answer is the noise was modeled based on actual radar track um, from the forecasted operations out uh, um, to 2026. Thank you, Michael. All right. So historical radar tracks and then the forecast moving forward. I think you touched on that, but uh, we, when you look at that noise tool, it shows the analysis for 2021, which is the first year the procedures could be implemented. And then we also show what that noise difference would look like between the proposed procedures and doing no action in 2026 as well. So that's, that's the kind of and, and Michael, just uh, to add to that a little bit. No, it's not based upon a part 150 study. These were uh, tracks were modeled specifically for this environmental assessment. And I think we've got dates in uh, 2018. They're, they're shown on the boards, uh, specific boards, when they were, when they were uh, reviewed. Great, thanks, Jim. And Lisa and Chris, tag team. Thank you. Okay, we'll, we'll move on to another question. Uh, this is actually one we've seen in a, in a few workshops, but uh, when are airports going to see more airplanes or more operations, I guess, like before COVID-19 happened. So, so from an FAA perspective, our role is to provide the safe and efficient separation of air traffic, services to air traffic, responding to the needs that exist in, across our, our US aviation system, across the aviation industry as, as they look to meet the demand that, that exists across our country. So we do stay in close contact with industry as a matter of our daily operation, but the FAA doesn't, doesn't control the flight schedules and uh, you know, the routes that airlines are flying you know, when you think of like city pairs. So I don't know if, if any of the airlines or pilots wanna add to that. Dan, did you have something? Yeah, um, I think we're all, we have this issue that our crystal balls are in the shop right now. <laughs> but in lieu of that, um, my company, which I'm representing Alpha, so I won't mention right now, but uh, our flight schedules are doubling from June to July. So uh, there's some optimism there. I saw um, some uh, in the news, this is not anything secret, some uh, potential furloughs that one airline is are going to be averted, looks like, from a deal. And looks as a sign, things are getting better. Uh, so just the indications I've seen on information like that. Uh, things are improving rapidly. Now, certain numbers at Tampa or St. Pete, you know, obviously I can't figure that out, forecast that, but uh, it's looking pretty good. Uh, so I'd say, um, I, I don't know when they'd come back wholly, but uh, the growth or the return is, is pretty promising. Okay, thanks, Dan. Um, and uh, Michael, I think I saw Adam Bouchard uh, from Tampa uh, chime in there. Adam, do you have something you wanted to say? No, I didn't, uh, Jim. Sorry about that. Oh, okay. okay. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Adam. I, I was looking over at a couple statistics. So Florida has, uh, when you look at data from recent, recent years, Florida is second in terms of the number of passengers that typically get on and utilize airplanes in the country. 49% uh, of the passengers arrive into Florida by air and aviation con historically contributes $175 billion annual economic impact to the state of Florida. So I just mentioned those statistics in terms of the general picture. I know that aviation is critical to Florida, the economy, many businesses that are there. And again, that's not specifically the FAA's focus. We're about the safe and efficient movement of traffic through the airspace system. But we, we all, I think, anticipate that the demand will continue to return and increase for aviation. All right, thanks everybody who, who jumped in on that one. All right, I have another question here. I live just south of St. Pete and I get a lot of planes over my house. 
uh, why can't you just take them over the water instead? All right. Uh, Jeff, do you have do you have that one? Oh, hey, Michael, I think it's Chris with, okay. with that. Right. Yeah. I'm sorry, I was looking at the screen wrong. All right, thanks, Chris. <laughs> So the top is with St. Pete, um, just to the right of and east or east is Tampa International McDill and then just south is Albert Witted. So depending on our flow at Tampa, if we went and kept St. Pete uh, aircraft out over the bay, they would conflict with either the rivals or departures um, in and out of Tampa. Okay. <clears throat> well, that, that makes sense. Hopefully everybody can see that. The if you were to turn to the east, that would be a problem. And so, as you can see, the south departures out of St. Pete head head west, and there's some land between the airport and the water. So, hopefully, that gets at what uh, the person asking the question is looking for with that one. Thanks. Sorry, Chris. Michael. Just to follow, just to kind of follow up to that with the procedures um, for safety, nothing changes. We still have our separation requirements, which is that minimum of three miles or a thousand feet vertically. Okay. All right, thanks, Chris. All right, here's another question. Does the no action and proposed project noise modeling include all Tampa and St. Pete aircraft operations or only those on the tracks that are being analyzed? Lisa? You want to start with that? Sure, I can tell you that um, we considered all the all the track data um, in the environmental analysis. Um, you can, uh, if we can pull up the noise tool again, and we can look at the study area. It it shows all of those tracks, and and it took into account um, noise from all over the study area. Um, you can see those. Uh, blue dots all over that map. Those are those um, census track, uh, census um, information that we collected and we collected that noise at all of those. So it did take into account. I don't know if you have anything to add, Jim, but. Well, just, uh, you know, maybe a, a little bit of a clarification for me and, and for whomever asked the, uh, the question. So we looked at all of the track data and then when we model the change, it's the change that's on the proposed procedures themselves, that's correct? correct? That's correct. So then the other, I mean, obviously it would be um, a wash or no change for the other areas that aren't impacted by the procedures. Those areas remain the same, absolutely. Uh -huh. and, it shows, and it shows the change in noise in the areas of the change. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. All right, very good. But I think we touched maybe a little bit on this, but it says your study states the procedures use procedural deconfliction. What is the separation criteria for procedural deconfliction? That, that's probably on the air traffic side, right? Jeff? Sure, Mike, I'll take that one. Uh, it's a uh, thousand feet and three miles, and that's pretty standard for aircraft that'll be on the procedure in our airspace and uh, that will not change with the procedures. Okay, so 1,000 feet vertical separation or three miles if you're at the same altitude, right? Or three miles, yeah, three miles lateral. Or, right, lateral, okay. Correct. Very good, thanks, Jeff. Okay, we have another question. How will this impact reroutes during weather events and when Jacksonville Center is volume constrained? So we may want to actually tee that up a little bit about what the facility roles are, maybe just a little bit, but I'm looking to see. Air traffic, can you help with yeah, that, Chris? Sure, sure. Uh, Chris, you can take it. Oh. <laughs> All right, yeah, I'm a former center guy too. So I worked at Jack Center. This. Um, for what we do, there's a lot of times where weather blocks our procedures and their rivals, and it's coordination between the controllers, supervisors at each of the facilities 
to keep that same flow going, but just on a different vector or <clears throat> rooting away from the weather. Okay. So, I mean, weather wouldn't be an unusual event in Florida, obviously, and you don't, you don't put, you're not going to utilize routes that are blocked. I don't know if anybody else has anything to add to that, but that's, that's a normal part of managing traffic in the system. Right. And Michael, I don't know, maybe we could ask, uh, you know, air traffic again, because we, you know, we've heard the question about, hey, I've seen some airplanes over my house more frequently recently or at different times. And then the weather question kind of brings to mind that, you know, um, the Tampa area is also impacted by weather. Are there um, any challenges from the seasonal weather in the area? One of the air traffic guys maybe could help us out with. Chuck? Kind of continue, I guess. Yeah, just um, we're used to it. I, I feel like down here and we train for it a lot um, with weather, but uh, it's constantly changing and evolving and we have to as well. For the most part during the summer, <clears throat> the winds are typically out of the south and we are landing in a south flow, but depending on the weather, we, uh, we, we can change and, and run to a north flow. Um, and even occasionally, uh, very rare, but we will even use the east-west runways for arrivals when needed, just all based off of weather conditions. So what yeah, just, uh, just to jump off of that, that would explain why people might be seeing airplanes in different places that they never did before or that they usually don't. Okay, thank you. All right, very good. Okay, we received this question earlier this week about a local news story. So uh, I saw a news article this week that said older airplanes like MD-80s are not flying at Sarasota anymore. Will that reduce the noise? So that may be something, I don't know if any, any of our industry uh, participants want to speak to that, Dan, and then Lisa, if you have anything to add as well. Um, yeah, the... Um... The airplanes that are coming online now, last two and a half years or so, are kind of a third generation beyond what you had with the MD-80. Uh, the airplanes flying now, the, the engines are so much quieter. And then this generation that just came out um, are, are even more so. And there's not a lot of them yet. They're still coming online. But um, so the more and more airplanes you get that replace those you know, two generations ago, it's, it's gonna make a sizable difference. When you're at the airport, maybe not as much, but um, flying overhead, uh, certainly at high altitudes, and then even as you approach the airport, you'll notice the difference. Okay. All right, thanks, Dan. And Lisa, do you have anything to share about some of what FAA is doing on that front? Sure, sure. I'd like to add the FAA has an active program called the Continuous Lower Energy Emissions and Noise Program, and we call that the CLEAN program. Um, and it's a program to advance the development of technologies um, to further reduce noise from the aircraft. And the program supports the FAA's technology and um, alternative jet fuel solution set. Um, CLEAN will develop and mature environmentally friendly technologies for civil, civil super, um, uh, subsonic jet aircraft. And um, these technologies are right in line with our goals and, and initiatives, that CLEAN program initiative and is developed to um, uh, certify, certify aircraft technology to reduce the um, noise level at 32 decibels uh, cumulative relative to noise standards. So, um, there's a lot of information about that program. You're welcome to read about that program if you go to the FAA's website. And also if you send an email to um, uh, clean, C-L-E-E-N at FAA.gov, um, someone can send you all the information. Someone will send you all the information you want to read up about all of our efforts that we're doing in that program that'll help reduce that noise. Jim, you had something you want to add? I did. I wanted to, because, um, you know, Michael Lee and I were talking about this a little bit earlier because we did see a similar question um, last night. 
noise really is a science. And, you know, we've worked really hard. I'll say industry has worked really hard to give us those high bypass ratio engines and really cut down on engine noise, which was a, a key source of noise. But the other part of that, and, uh, you know, Dan alluded to it, is airframe noise. So the airframes now are so much more efficient. If you think about, um, you know, what, uh, you know, what, it, what creates noise on an airplane? Well, when you put wheels down and it's landing, uh, cowlings, flaps, all, all the different aerodynamic surfaces, you know, if they're not efficient, then they create noise, they create drag. So there's a, two parts to that. They, by cleaning up that airframe and making it more efficient, you decrease the airplane noise that's generated by the airframe itself, but there's, a, there's another benefit. It helps to reduce emissions. It helps to reduce energy required to push that airplane on through the air, if, if you will. So it decreases fuel use and emissions and it decreases noise. So um, we talked about airplanes being a couple of generations different. Every new airplane that comes off the line has to be stage four noise certified now. Uh, and I think that's everything above 75,000 pounds. And we're already working on stage five noise standards. So there's been a, you know, huge changes in the approach to noise and, and noise mitigation than, uh, you know, compared to when that MD-80, you know, first came off the line. We're, we're much better off. All right. Very good. Thanks again. I, I, and we had a, another tag team. <laughs> I'll, I'll move on to another question that's come in. During IFR conditions, the arrivals into the St. Pete Clearwater International Airport, runway 18, the arrival is straight over uh, Safety Harbor. Are there any plans to curtail these aircraft over the water using a different kind of approach? We probably could pull up a, a board to show that. <clears throat> Michael, I'll take that one. This is Chuck. Thanks, uh, Chuck. During IFR conditions, and just to explain what that means, is instrument flight rules where the pilots use their instruments to guide them to the airport versus visual flight rules where they're looking out the window and seeing the airport and flying visually to the ground. When the weather is bad, we have to use a straight in approach to that runway uh, into runway 18, which is the south coming from the north landing to the south. So that would take those aircraft over that, over that area. Unfortunately, the uh, the way the airport is set up, uh, there's no way around that. Um, during the visual flight rules, when the pilots are looking out the window, certain aircraft are taken out over the uh, the bay, the North Bay, and they come in offshore, off the bay a little bit, and then turn towards the airport right at the last uh, couple miles before land. They can do that when they're looking out visually, but they can't do that when they're using their instruments. We can't uh, set up procedures allow the aircraft to fly through the clouds and turn at that rate closer to the airport. Hope that answers the question. No, that's good, Chuck. I, I think that's helpful. Uh, the, actual, the actual satellite procedures don't come all the way down to the ground. You know, we're not flying those down to the ground into St. Pete. So they're flying uh, that stable approach in that's lined up with the runway. So hopefully I'm Hopefully I'm saying what you did. I probably shouldn't have even jumped in on that one. <laughs> no, that, what you said is right, Mark. We, we, right. and if you ask the industry, uh, uh, they'll tell you the same thing. They're, they're not comfortable flying an instrument procedure that's gonna turn them right for the last second on a, basically about a 45 degree uh, turn there, 30 to 45 degree turn that close to the airport when they're not able to see the ground. Um, I'm not sure that, that, that we could do that legally from the FAR standpoint as well. Okay. If I could, if I could add to that as well, if you see those tracks in, um, in, in pink that go over the bay, the majority of those, well, all of those are air carriers. Those are the big airplanes. The ones that are straight in over Safety Harbor, those are generally the smaller aircraft that are less noisy. Um, so those, the, the tracks over the water are the big ones. Um, and the, we do have to take the larger aircraft on the straight in, uh, you know, like the original question was when uh, weather's bad, so. Great. Okay, thank you both. I don't know if you want me to add to that. Um, there there are things we can do, but um, 
you always have to give up something. If you uh, make some turns at the last minute, you have to have a higher ceiling that you pop out of the clouds or before you can see the airport. If that's the case, then not, and not as many airplanes can get in there because if the weather is lower, then you can't land there. You have to divert somewhere. So uh, things come at a cost. If, it's, uh, if you live in the community and you have uh, meetings with the airport, you can always discuss with the airport what things you're willing to trade off for quiet, more quiet around there. So it just depends on the community and the airport, what the people wish. And uh, it's kind of a local thing in that case. Okay, thanks, Dan. Well, keep us moving. Uh, here's a question. Are airplanes getting louder or quieter? Uh, seems like we touched a little bit on that. Lisa, anything to add or anybody in, in the industry team? Sure, I'll, I'll give it a try. Um, uh, simply put, all newer aircraft are more efficient and quieter. The FAA's Office of Environment and Energy has worked um, more than 50 years or so um, with the air carriers and manufacturers to reduce noise at the source, those aircraft engine. And um, extensive information is available at FAA.gov. And once you're there, you can search on Office of Environment and Energy and find some additional information on that. Trey, did you have anything? <laughs> okay, all right, we'll keep moving. There, there are plenty of questions ahead. So the FAA has said it had some errors in the online information. Is that in the environmental assessment and did it affect your analysis? So I'll just take that real quick. The, those were inadvertent errors that did not affect our analysis. So we identified that there were a couple of runway designations at Orlando and Tampa and St. Pete Clearwater in one of the chapters of the document describing those runway orientations, and those were in error. We, we made those corrections on May 13th, which was two days after the draft DA was published. So the, the correct information has been in the, in the posted documentation since May 13th, and all of our analysis was done in accordance with the appropriate runway coordinates, a runway orientation, I should say. So I think that probably covers that one. I'll just give another quick reminder that we're seeing a lot of people continue on Zoom, a lot of folks on social media. So keep, keep the questions coming. You can text us at 949-478-0253 or use the Q&A button within Zoom Again, 949-478-0253. All right, so here's a question. What is the separation standard in the en route portion? And are you using radar separation or procedural separation? Sounds like an air traffic controller test question. <laughs> Chris, do you have that? <laughs> Michael, thanks. Um, we use all radar separation back and forth between um, and, and the thousand feet vertical. Um, so I guess that's your basic angle. Basically, they see further, so they use the increased mileage. Uh, we use a shorter range uh, radar can, and can go down to three separation. And that, of course, is all laterally, a thousand foot vertically. Okay, five miles laterally, a thousand feet vertically. I think is what I heard, Chris. You were, you were uh, a little bit uh, choppy coming through on that one. Um, okay, that's, that's the kids off the internet. <laughs> okay, so non radars used at lower altitudes, I think, was in there as well. If, if I miss something on that, Chris, we can come back to that. Um, all right, we'll move on. I live in Bayview, north of St. Pete Airport. We already get a lot of noise from aircraft. Are we gonna get more with the Metroplex and how high will those planes be over the area? Hey, Michael, this is Jeff, I'll take that one. Okay, thanks, If we Jeff. get the uh, St. Pete South Flow and North Flow boards, I uh, can answer the question and give you a little bit of a visual to see it. 
the basic answer is no, uh, you won't see um, more aircraft there with the Metroplex procedure. The way the procedures are designed, uh, St. Pete's departing northbound over the bay uh, with the bigger jets, the Airbuses. Um, we don't turn those airplanes till they're out of 3,000 feet. We do that today and that'll continue to be that way when the procedures go into effect. If we're landing to the south at St. Pete, uh, the aircraft will still be where they are today. Nothing has changed with Metroplex as far as that goes. Okay, Jack, thanks. Okay, looks like an, a lot of departures south of Tampa International. Is that let me let me read that a little bit differently. It looks like somebody's seeing a lot of departures south of Tampa International. Is that new? And do those go over the bay? Again, we can pull up boards if that would help. Uh, Chuck, did you have that one? Yeah, I'll take that one, Michael. Uh, there, there's no new procedures uh, today or when the Metroplex starts up that will take aircraft on a different departure flight path to the south. Uh, there's no proposals for that. Um, what you're seeing today is if, if there's aircraft that are flying departing over land then maybe for uh, traffic purposes or for weather uh, reroutes. Uh, generally on the south flow from Tampa, we turn aircraft over the bay and climb them before we turn northbound. And like Jeff mentioned a minute ago, we don't turn aircraft until they leave 3,000 feet. So that would be no different um, when the uh, new procedures start up than they are today. And you'll see on the uh, on the flight track the uh, pink. Uh, that's aircraft that are uh, from the ground at three thousand feet, and uh, and we don't turn them to the north. You see how it turns blue, and that's when they get above three thousand feet. That's when we turn them to the north. Okay, Chuck. Thanks. Okay, we have another question. What about my neighbor who doesn't have the internet and and libraries are closed? How do they learn about this? All right, so we, we've actually been watching that for, for many weeks, and I know many of the libraries across the state have opened. We provided notice, notification and also uh, the environmental assessment on flash drives at libraries, I think 117 across the state. But if there are people that can't access that at their local library, and you can provide any information to us through uh, the chat, which is confidential, or, or call or text us that information, again, you could use the same 949-478-0253 and we'll respond about that specific case. Okay, I'll, I'll keep moving. Are the current flight approaches changing or are they being modified? Um, I guess maybe that's specific to Tampa. Yeah, uh, Mike, I'll take that one. Uh, there are no approaches in Tampa that are being modified. Uh, nor into St. Pete. So uh, the, the approaches into the airports will be remaining the same. The changes taking place with Metroplex will be uh, at higher altitudes. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. All right, uh, we're gonna continue answering questions until 1.30. I'm kind of glancing at the clock here. So keep your questions coming. You can text a question at 949-478-0253, or you can use the, the Q&A button within Zoom. We have a question here uh, uh, that we received yesterday. I'm just hearing about this project. Why are you just telling people about it now? Um, Okay, so we may, we may have a couple people who want to chime in on this, but this this round of workshops is actually our second set of meetings that we've done across South and Central Florida. Last year we were in we held 17 workshops across from Tampa, St. Pete, through Orlando, West Palm, Fort Lauderdale, Miami, and we received a little bit over a thousand comments on the project before we finalized the designs that we wanted to do the environmental analysis on. So we, we introduced the project last year around this time. We got some feedback from the public, had a lot of media coverage in that, met with a lot of people, 
took those back into consideration for our designs, and then we did the environmental analysis that you've heard a lot about and that's documented in the draft EA. So a lot of the comments we got are reflected in changes to those proposed designs, and that's what we're back to share in this second round. So we hope that the information we're sharing on the website and through the web, the web virtual workshop is is informative for you. And if you haven't had a chance to go through the front part under, under floridametroplexworkshops.com, I would encourage you to click on your specific location and you can see videos in detail. You can come, you can pull back up the boards, the, the flight procedure graphics that we've been showing at different times in the workshop. You can click through the noise tool that Lisa's demonstrated and Kind of, you can just get a lot of good information on the project background, and that's that's in addition to the entire environmental assessment document itself. So there's some tools you can use, and hopefully you'll find what you're looking for to feel like you're up to speed on the project. I haven't mentioned it recently, so I will say we're in a public comment period. We do welcome your feedback. That's open until July 10th. All right, I'll move to another question. Did the airport ask you to do this project? Okay, uh, so there, there are a lot of factors. A short answer to that up front is no, this is an FAA project and it falls under our responsibility for safe and efficient movement of airplanes through the national airspace system. So there are a lot of stakeholders that have to be involved anytime that you change the infrastructure. So this is the aviation equivalent of modernizing our, our nation's highways, roadways, bridges, railways, th things like that, but this is up in the air. So we do work with stakeholders who were connecting to their airport infrastructure. We talk to airlines and pilots who operate the aircraft and they have the flight management equipment in the cockpit, folks that we talk to, and we, we work together to try to make that system more safe and more efficient. Uh, there's some benefits that we talked about in the intro video that as we do a better job of defining a precise procedure, then that brings our air traffic controllers, the pilots in the cockpit, and even the equipment on the airplane onto the same page about what that route looks like exactly. And that level of precision and pre predictability helps us with the safety and the overall flow of the system. So you can imagine there's some back and forth, there's some dialogue about whether a change might be flyable, is a term that we use whether that'll work for aircraft in the fleet mix at a given airport and then we also talk with airports uh, because they have awareness of where sensitive uh, community sound sensitivities are and they help make us aware of those that we can consider in, in the design process as well i don't know if anybody else wants to add to that certainly it's a it's a collaborative effort but this is an faa federal action Right. And Michael, you know, this, uh, I like answering this type of a question and we, we've heard, heard questions like it before. So it's got several parts to it. You know, it's the, it's the Tampa park. It's what's over, what's flying over my house. Um, you know, who did you work with on that project? Absolutely. It's an, it's an FAA project. We worked very closely with the airport to make sure that we were conforming to those existing uh, procedures. So, you know, people ask, well, why, why are you doing this if you're not making any changes around the airport? So that's where we didn't implement procedures that are coded from the runway. They're going to continue to radar vector like they did. So we would have, if we had done the, gone that other route, then we would proceduralize some of that separation by, you know, building that into those coded procedures. But we didn't do that below 10,000 feet. We were, we worked very closely with the airport to uh, ensure that, you know, we, uh, collaborated with them and that we conformed to, uh, you know, their needs for their constituents around the airport. And I can tell uh, anybody listening to the, the webcast today that Tampa and uh, St. Pete Clearwater did a really great job representing, you know, their communities. In a larger sense outside of the Tampa area, and Michael, you talked to it, uh, you know, in a couple of a couple of ways here that we're modernizing the entire national airspace system. So it's not just about Tampa; it's about those routes between the you know major metroplex areas. And I don't mean that in just a project sense, but major metropolitan uh, areas. It's the 
change that we're bringing to the national airspace system through that next generation air transportation system, next gen. So we are, we're moving from an analog age into uh, an age where we're using digital communications. We're incorporating data communication. So at this point, for, uh, we can transmit, electronically transmit clearances, uh, you know, the control tower, you know, to the to the flight deck, they can load that into the flight management system, and that reduces error. It reduces time required for them to, uh, you know, devote that attention to the the flight deck and the flight management system. When we modernize the and go to digital communications through the entire air traffic control system, and that includes the uh, in route air traffic control system, we plan to move into an age where well, in the in route environment that we can transmit those clearances digitally and get those same benefits out of it. And one of, one of the key factors that these procedures play in that, uh, you know, they are accurate and they're repeatable and they're predictable that this system that we are implementing throughout the national airspace system moves to one where we can predict the trajectory of aircraft across the entire system. And that's where we gain those efficiencies. We know where you're going to be before you push back off the gate, you know, based upon the, the routes that we're implementing throughout the national airspace system. So it's a, it's a modernization of the entire system, just like those roadways. You know, we're creating those on ramps and off ramps to that higher altitude structure. So even though we're not making those changes below 10,000 feet in the immediate terminal area here, we're making an impact on the rest of this system as we modernize the entire NAS or national airspace system. All right, very good, Jim, thanks. Thorough explanation. So I'm gonna try to keep us sort of moving and on schedule here. Um, how will the, it's another question we received yesterday. So how will the Metroplex help Florida? And I'll just hit that real quick. But the project affects 21 airports across the study area. We talked a little bit about that earlier. And in total, there are 106 new procedures that are more efficient satellite-based and conventional air traffic control procedures that help us improve the safety and efficiency for Florida. It helps us make the best use of the airspace and those procedures based on that satellite technology. So a couple of bullet points, uh, it'll benefit passengers by creating more direct routes, helping to reduce flight delays. It'll help us decrease congestion at airports and in the air. It also improves air traffic flows, enhancing safety and efficiency. And it enables us to bring the procedures up, as Jim was saying, to to today's standards. So the precise predictable routes help reduce the complexity and the communication in the system. We can take advantage of the new technology and the new infrastructure that Jim mentioned uh, between air traffic and the cockpit. Uh, and all of that helps make the system safer. safer. Um, so I'll, I'll probably leave it at that and, and keep us moving. We've, we have another one that came in that's probably good to repeat. Uh, some people, we, we use the word procedure a lot. So uh, I hear the word procedure used. What, what does that mean? What is a procedure? Can we help make sure everybody understands what we're talking about there? Uh, Chuck, looks like maybe you're going to take that. Yeah, I think that what, uh, what you and Jim just described was exactly what that is, a procedure. Uh, basically, uh, a procedure, just to simplify it as much as I can, uh, it's taking the directions to go from one airport to another across the country and, and compressing it into one, um, and, and to one instruction so that the pilot knows what we expect them to do. And, um, and, and they're going to do what, uh, uh, they're going to do that so that we can navigate other aircraft around, around that particular flight. Uh, so if you think about it in dynamics with eight to 9,000 airplanes in the air at one time, everybody's or most aircraft are on these procedures, we understand what they're gonna do and we, and we can expect them to do what they're gonna do. And, uh, and we're not allowing aircraft to get too close to each other. So the procedure is based on what Jim just described and, and Michael, you did a great job of following up with that. Okay, Chuck, thanks. So we'll, we'll come back, we'll keep this in, in air traffic's world probably. Does this mean more concentration of airplane traffic? Chris? Hey, Michael, I'll, I'll try and take it. Is this working sounding better? It is. You sound good. <laughs> okay. So, yes, there could be a more concentration just because of the precision moving from the, the land-based navigation 
to the GPS, RNAV, or satellite based. It's not necessarily uh, more airplanes, it's just that they're more accurately flying over certain spots or areas, I guess. Left myself muted. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> Okay, I know I saw another question in here. Bear with me for a moment. So there's a question, what is DNL? What is DB? That was in the video. Lisa, can you give a little bit more explanation on that? Sure, I can. And if, and if we pull this graphic up, it, it'll um, help me describe it. Um, DNL, simply put, is the standard noise metric used by uh, used for all FAA studies of aviation noise exposure in airport communities. And DB is a uh, abbreviation or short for decibel, and it is the unit uh, used to measure the intensity of noise, of, of sound. Um, and this graphic uh, will, is a, probably a better, gives a better uh, comparative, um, help you understand kind of what noise levels are like with common indoor sounds and common outdoor sounds. And if you uh, take a look at this, this um, graphic, it shows that, you know, one common outdoor sound that everybody, you know, normally is bothered by and complained, complains about are the B747-400 taken off um, at takeoff. And it can kind of be compared to if you're indoor at a rock band concert um, and the noise associated, noise level associated there is listed at about 110 uh, dB. Um, if you go down the chart, you can see a, um, a lawnmower at three feet or a diesel truck at 150 feet. Um, it can be compared to a, a food processor or a blender or someone inside shouting. Um, you can see the noise level associated with that as well. Um, also, you know, if you're a little bit further away from the source of that noise, a B747-800 at takeoff, but if you're up two miles away, it can be compared to indoor, common indoor sound of a vacuum cleaner at 10 feet away. So this kind of, this chart gives you a good little depiction and kind of can put it in perspective for you. If you would like to see that, you can always log on to faa.gov slash regulations and um, search for the comparative noise level chart. And this graphic will come up. Thank All you. All right, Michael. Lisa, thanks. Hey, Michael, if I could, uh, you know, just one quick follow up on that. I know we're running short on time. Lisa and I talked about this too. Sometimes people ask us about the 2018 Appropriations Act where Congress directed us to look at alternative noise metrics, an alternative to the uh, the DNL standard, but that has that has not happened yet, and that, that that standard isn't established, and it does not apply to this particular project. Is that that correct? Okay. Thank you, thank you, Jim. That's a good point. Um, we we are bound by uh, in our environmental analysis, we are bound by our order, which is FA Order Ten. 50.1 um, F, I think we're on. Um, and it requires us to use this, the standards that we used in this document. So anything outside of that, it requires a change to our orders to be able to consider that. Thanks. All right, thank you both. And that's a helpful clarification, Jim. All right. Uh, we have a question. Has the FAA made a final decision to implement this project? I may start out with that. Jim, I don't know if you if you want to add to it, but we, uh, we're moving forward with the project, so we've made progress. We published the draft environmental assessment for the proposed new routes on May 11th, and that initiated a 60-day public comment period. I think I've mentioned a couple times that closes on July 10th, so the FAA will consider all the comments that comes in during that comment period. The environmental assessment identifies the action that we're proposing, but no final decision will be made until we have the opportunity to consider all the comments that come in uh, during that comment period. It's our hope 
and our intention to issue a final environmental determination by September 30th. And then I know it was mentioned earlier in the workshop, but we anticipate implementing new procedures if, if all of that moves forward uh, in the best way possible, then we would anticipate implementing new procedures in two phases next year and hopefully wrapping up that South Central Florida Metroplex project by September 2021. So just some dates and timeframes, Jim, anything to add to that? No, sir, you got it very thoroughly. Okay. All right. So I'm, I'm doing a quick time check here. I actually think that that's going to bring us to the end of our workshop. So I want to thank everybody for participating. Uh, I, hope, I hope that you found our answers informative. There, there were some really good questions that we took in the workshop today. I want to thank all the specialists who provided your expertise and our entire FAA communications team, all the others who supported the workshop in the background. I want to acknowledge our industry representatives who joined us to contribute your perspectives to the discussions today. So thank you for that. As a reminder, the questions that came in today are not part of the legal record for the draft environmental assessment. So if you want to comment for the record, please go to the comments tab on, on the website floridametroplexworkshops.com. You can also email us or send us a written comment and the addresses for that you can also be found on the comments tab on this website. Uh, one more reminder, the comment period is open until July 10th of 2020. And then after the comment period closes, the FAA will consider and review all the substantive comments received during the comment period. We expect to issue an environmental determination in September 2020. I mentioned earlier this workshop's being recorded and will be available for playback. You can share it with friends and family. It'll be available on this same website tomorrow. And that concludes our workshop this afternoon. Thanks again for joining us.